station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston station, we are ready for the event. Space.com, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Space.com. How do you hear me? And station's got you loud and clear. Welcome aboard, Claire. Thank you so much for talking to us. Did you all have a good Christmas and New Year's in space? Almost any day up here is a great day. So they were they were wonderful holidays, and uh, the Christmas holiday was made extra special because we've got we got our crewmates that joined us and doubled the crew size. How are you all feeling about the upcoming SpaceX Dragon visit to the station? Is that a pretty significant milestone? Yeah, we're excited about that. Anytime you have a visiting vehicle come, coming by, that's, a, that's an exciting day. And it's going to be packed with all kinds of supplies for us. And it's sort of the first of many wagon train wagons coming up here to bring us supplies. And one of the neat things about the SpaceX vehicle is that it will allow us to take significant payloads down, which is a real important thing. Uh, when, uh, since we no longer fly shuttles, we can't take anything size back down from space station without just it burning up and SpaceX will be our route to getting all these scientific uh, uh, samples and uh, broken pieces of hardware that need to be refurbished and things like that back to the ground. Well, some of our readers here at space.com have written in with some questions of their own for you guys. So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask some of these and whoever uh, likes to can take a crack at answering. Um, our reader, P. Edward Murray, wrote in to thank the commander for sharing that wonder wonderful photo of Comet Lovejoy. What was it like to see that amazing view of the comet? Yeah, Claire, it was, a, it was spectacular. Um, I, I, I think I said this uh, uh, to the first folks at Detroit News that I talked about uh, after it happened. It was uh, just one of those one of those cases where we're just very lucky to be in a certain position at a certain time. Um, I, we had we had just finished a night pass and we were coming over Australia, and the sun was about ready to come up, and there was this incredibly bright dark green glow that was, at least from my my perspective, glow that was extending up from where the sun was about to emerge above uh, Earth's limb. And at the time, I had no idea what it was, and uh, I didn't even have the presence of mind to take but just a very quick uh, camera shot that day. And uh, it was the next morning that I realized and learned from uh, from Houston, the specialist there, uh, that it was a comet that wasn't expected to survive uh, a close pass to the sun. And over the next several days, we just had some wonderful opportunities to get some great imagery of it. Neat. Well, another reader named Will Dean wrote in to ask, how does microgravity and being in space affect your dreams? While you're sleeping. Yes, well, um, so far my dreaming is uh, still like like on Earth. In the first days uh, you arrive, uh, uh, you don't sleep that good. I mean, uh, actually you don't want to sleep. It's too exciting to be uh, to be here. Um, but yeah, the dreams themselves didn't change in my case. Maybe the others have other experiences. Uh, when when I'm on Earth, I'll often dream about flying. And now that I'm up here and I can fly, I'll be dreaming about walking. And I guess it just shows that even in your dreams, there's a certain measure of discontent. Reader named Elizabeth Byrne um, wrote to ask if any of you have made any New Year's resolutions. No That's a great question, um, and uh, we're just kind of looking at each other. We've been so busy, even through the holidays here with handover and, and so forth, that we really hadn't, at least I and, and Andre and Don, hadn't really had a chance to make uh, any New Year's resolutions. I guess if we had one to make, it would be to find time to spend a little bit more uh, quality time in the windows in the cupola and uh, in uh, some of the nadir-facing windows to look at planet Earth from here. 
Brandon Murray asks, uh, just how bad is the space junk issue in relation to the safety of the ISS and its crew? Yeah, sure. I thought they were talking about the inside a station. Yeah, the space debris uh, is of course an issue in space, but not so much for the for the station. Uh, a lot of the debris is at uh, uh, at different altitudes than where the space uh, station is, and on top of that, um, a lot of the, the big pieces are followed by the ground, and so if any uh, thing is coming close to us, we can even make evasive maneuvers, which is very rare. Uh, and it's very conservative, uh, but uh, so we are in a very safe condition here at this altitude. And Robert J. Carhart asks, are there any job opportunities up there? Well, I, we're just saying I think there's an awful lot of work to do, number one, and and uh, whereas a lot of folks want to fly in space station, would love to be astronauts and cosmonauts, and I would absolutely encourage them to do that. I think the future is very bright for young folks right now that are looking to get into this business, but we need legions of folks on the ground that help design these vehicles, that help design and operate the, let, a lot of these experiments remotely, and uh, and are helping to build the next generation of rockets and spaceships to carry us beyond, beyond low Earth orbit. So I, for one, am very optimistic about the future, and I think it's a great, great opportunity for young folks right now to, to, uh, to join the force and uh, help us down the road. Uh, a reader named Jeffrey Dean Root writes in to, to ask, uh, what are some examples of some of the science research you're doing on the space station that will help prepare us for manned missions beyond low Earth orbit? Okay, well, w w one set of experiments that we're working on are experiments we do on ourselves. They're human experiments, and Andre is a living example of that right now, where he's covered with little pieces of computer and pumps and things that continuously monitor his blood pressure, and from that, it's actually beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure, and from that you can determine the cardiac work that your heart is putting out for uh, whatever mode of exercise you happen to be doing. So, so that's one experiment that we're, we're doing in terms of the human life studies. The other things that we're doing up here is what I refer to as engineering research. It's mundane things like how to make a toilet that works and how to take your urine from that you collect in your toilet and process that and make it back into drinking water. And we're doing that right now on station. We've got three big chunks of equipment. Uh, one's a toilet, one's a processor, and the other's a galley, and they're all hooked together. And you'll go into the toilet, and the machines will whir and wind and grumble, and then you go and make yourself a bag of coffee. And, and it's, it's the kind of technology we need to have if we're going to go away from planet Earth for long periods of time. John Reed asks, uh, given the chance, would any of you volunteer for a two-year mission to Mars? Yeah. I, for one, absolutely. Yes, me too. I would like to bring my family, though. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> So we know that the space shuttle is retired by now, but do you anticipate this year will be any less busy on the space station? Well, all of us that, that uh, had the privilege and pleasure to fly in the shuttle all feel a little bit upset that we've lost that great asset. But the fact is the shuttle's done the thing that it, it was exquisitely well designed to do, and that is to build a nearly million pound space station in low Earth orbit. So in addition to Hubble and many of the other things that is done, one of the key things that the Hubble was unique um, to do was to be able to actually launch huge payloads, bring them up here in the, with, uh, with an onboard robotic arm and an onboard EVA capability, spacewalk capability, allow us to build this incredible uh, facility. Now, that, now the, the job for us is to actually put it to use to answer all these questions so that we can go back to the moon and space, we can go on to Mars, asteroids and so forth. And Space Station is, for a lot of the U.S. science, is 
very well designed and very well equipped to do that, but now we've got a very busy road ahead of us between now and 2020 or perhaps as late as 2028 to answer all those questions so we can, we can take the next steps. Well, thank you all so much and we wish you safe flying. Claire, thank you. It was a pleasure talking with you today and uh, all the best to you and your readers. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Space.com portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from Fox News Radio. Station, this is Fox News Radio. How do you hear me? Fox News, International Space Station, we've got you loud and clear. Welcome aboard, Evan. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you all again, and um, uh, I hope everything is going well up there. First of all, I have to ask you, uh, we're, we're seeing a video feed of you, and uh, uh, Commander Burbank, Mr. Pettit, you have something strapped to your leg. What, what is that? Uh, it's it's called a knee board. It's something that pilots wear when you're sitting in an airplane, so you have a, a pad of paper and a pencil at your disposal. Uh, here in weightlessness, it serves as a tool belt, at least for me. So I've got the pad and the paper, and I carry a pair of scissors, uh, two different flashlights, and a, a multi-purpose uh, tool. So uh, that way, uh, when I come up to something, I'm, I'm prepared to uh, either repair it, work on it, uh, eat it, or uh, take notes about it. So that's where you keep your lunch. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, I, I have a question, especially for you, Commander Burbank. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Dragon from SpaceX is scheduled to arrive, uh, you know, maybe in about a month. This is going to be the first non-state-sponsored, non-taxpayer ship, if you will. Uh, it's the ship you and your colleagues would likely use to get from the I to and from the ISS. How exciting is something like this? You know, we've moved away from the, the taxpayer-funded ship that's going to do this, essentially this taxi and trucking route. What, what is that like to be there for this? Well, I think for all of us, we're very excited about it. Number one, for the sake of the space station, that's critical capability. It's the ability to resupply station and to return critical hardware payloads or hardware that's failed that we need to get on the ground to analyze and perhaps refurbish it to be able to, to do that. And down the road, it also affords capability to, to actually deliver crew to space station, to and from space station. It's one of several companies that are actually working on that right now. So for all of us involved in that, I think that's very, very exciting. And anytime we have a visiting vehicle, be it a shuttle, be it a cargo vehicle, be it a Japanese HTV or European ATV or progress vehicles. All those things are exciting. They're dynamic events. There's something from the operational standpoint as pilots and engineers uh, that we're all very interested in. Um, all the vehicles that come to Space Station right now, like Dragon, like the HTV, um, and like the Cygnus, uh, the Orbital Sciences Cygnus vehicles that dock to the forward part of station actually don't dock autonomously. We actually will capture them. They'll fly up to space station and essentially formation fly with space station. We'll command them to free drift and we'll use the space, space station's robotic arm to grapple them and attach them to space station. So it's, an, it's from the standpoint of a pilot, that is a fun, interesting, uh, very dynamic kind of activity, and uh, we're all very much looking forward to it. It's also the, the start of a new era, having commercial vehicles that come to station. You, you talk about the, the start of a new era and commercial vehicles. If, if you could um, uh, wax historic for me, if you think, you know, in any type of human exploration throughout our history, you know, the, the government sent a vehicle first, and, and once they figured out how to get there and back pretty safely, uh, they opened it up to, to private industries. One, one thinks of perhaps maybe the Dutch West Indies uh, Company. Is this, uh, is this phase of, of space flight just like that? I mean, are we really moving into the, the real use of space? Yeah, I think this is uh, the, the, like like you said, like uh, the, the the shipping in the past. Uh, this is the same thing. Uh, we will see the uh, commercial companies taking over, industries taking over, and uh, agencies doing what they're meant to do, uh, exploring. So they will look ahead and go to uh, to new regions, new areas, uh, while uh, the commercial uh, companies take over the yeah the known ground by now. 
Mr. Kuypers, I, I hear that you got my cue about the Dutch part of, of exploration with the Dutch West Indies Corporation. Uh, you know, you your presence on the space station really demonstrates the international mission there. And, and there are many here in the U.S. that m- might not realize that Europe has a, a vibrant space program. What would you like Americans to know about your work up there? Well, uh, actually, Europe is indeed uh, uh, a small partner, but very intensively uh, involved in the space station, where uh, a lot of the modules are built in Europe. Uh, also, our uh, famous uh, cupola to, to look out the window, but a lot of the connecting modules, a lot of the equipment. What is very nice is that we mix it up. So we have European equipment, built uh, European equipment in the U.S. lab, and uh, U.S. equipment in the, in, the, in the Columbus module. So that's very nice, and actually, Europe is very well integrated uh, in uh, in the whole uh, US US segment like the Japanese are and uh, yeah I think it's uh, it's nice to know for Americans that uh, the U- Europeans build several parts of uh, of the space station and uh, the uh, the the cupola I've to- I've been told is probably just the 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 crown jewel of it. Uh, all three of you, have you had a chance to sit in it and take a look out? What, what does it look like for you know for some of us who who might not ever get to see that view, at least not with our own eyes? Speaking for myself, I'd say it's it's pretty much breathtaking. Um, if you get a chance to fly in space and you look through four to six inches worth of glass, say on a on a shuttle uh, window, for example, it is absolutely spectacular. Uh, it's almost indescribable. I don't know that that people that fly in space necessarily are the ones that can best describe that experience. If you get a chance to go outside and you get a chance to look at planet Earth through a very thin polycarbonate uh, visor and an EVA helmet, that is another whole order of magnitude more impressive. The cupola is very, very close to that. It's a place where onboard space station, you can essentially get a horizon to horizon, thousands of miles view, 360 degrees. You can look straight nadir right down to planet Earth, but you can also see all the way around. So it's really, it's, it's, it's not comparable with anything else that we have short of actually going outside and doing a spacewalk and the cupola is a great place for us to stage cameras we're doing some uh, some really neat um, videos and uh, high definition pictures of auroras and the comet and uh, and earth observations the cameras we have right now are much faster much more capable and the cupola is just a wonderful place to do some of this well, gentlemen, I will uh, let you get on with your day. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time out and, and uh, coming to the microphone. We, we really do appreciate hearing from you guys up there, and it is, it's certainly a cool thing to be able to sit at my desk and, and, and talk to you folks all the way up there. Please stay safe, and uh, we'll see you on the ground when you come home. Hopefully you, you will enjoy the rest of your time. I'm sure we will. Evan, thanks very much. It was great to have you on board, and uh, all the best to you and to your listeners. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, Space.com and Fox News Radio. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.